Today is Friday, March 4th, and my name is Brandon Springer. This interview with Bill Cohen and Mary Hay is being filmed from Maria Rogers Oral History Program. It's being filmed by Chandler Routman. So before we begin, Bill and Mary, could you both state your names and where you were born and your, what year you were born? You want me to go first? Yes, please. Okay, I'm Bill Cohen. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Actually, it was probably Manhattan where I was actually born. But I lived in Brooklyn when I was born, and I was born in 1940. Um, my name is Mary Hay, and I was born in Minneapolis in 1949. So Mary, we'll start with you. Please tell me briefly about the city project, how it got started, and what your long-term goals were, and what your role was. Okay. Um, the sister city. Uh, organization, which was called the Soviet Sister City Project uh, for the first uh, five years of its life, um, was started in 1983. It was, uh, the, I was one of the co-founders. There was uh, another woman and myself who really were the initiators and then we formed committees and so forth and it grew. Um, <clears throat> our goal was, well it's the Sister City's goal, was to promote peace through uh, people to people connections. This was uh, Sister Cities International was started in 1956, and that was the Eisenhower's goal. And our goal in s particular was to, uh, ha we found an abysmal level of knowledge about the Soviet Union, uh, not only in the public, but in ourselves, and uh, decided that, that a really excellent way to promote peace and maybe some, a way that had to happen because uh, the arguments always ended up in kind of a dead end, was to have more Russians and Soviet people come around so people could actually meet them and, uh, and somehow uh, sort of bite into the demonization of this entire country that's 11 time zones that we're all lumped together into one thing. <laughs> so our goals uh, were to establish the project um, in order to, to provide uh, a way for Soviet citizens and Americans uh, to, to travel and get to know each other. So Bill, the same questions. If you could tell me a little bit about Boulder Action for Soviet Jury, how it got started, what your role was, and what the long-term goals were. OK. Um, Boulder Action for Soviet Jury, which we uh, initialize as BASJ, got started because Mary uh, was on the cusp of establishing a sister city relationship between Boulder and Dushanbe, Tajikistan. And also because uh, there was a serious problem of refuseniks in the Soviet Union. People who had applied to leave the Soviet Union had been refused permission to do so, which was an international human right uh, recognized by the Soviet Union and virtually every other country. Um, and most of them were fairly significantly persecuted in one way or another because they sought to leave. In particular, um, there was one refusenik who was the father of a Boulder resident, Nal Maiman, whose uh, daughter Olga Plum lived here. Um, so when the uh, Sister City thing started going, uh, my wife and I met with Murray Richtel, who had just toured the Soviet Union meeting refuseniks. And I had met with Mary and, and uh, raised the issue of refuseniks with her, and she seemed reluctant to get involved with it. And we decided to form some kind of a institution, group, organization to address the problem of refuseniks <coughs> in the sister city and in general, and take up now Maiman's case. Uh, in fact, as Mary is quite uh, correct, we'd never heard of Dushanbe. We had no idea if there were even Jews there. Um, we subsequently got a list through contacts of wh what I counted was 95, but I've recounted it. There actually were 100 Jewish refuseniks in Dushanbe, population of about 20,000 Jews, and many of them had been in that region. Dushanbe is a relatively new city. Uh, but in Tashkent and uh, Uzbekistan for hundreds of years. 
Um, and so we called a meeting, organized our group, called it Boulder Action for Soviet Jewry, and began advocating for uh, the right of the 100 Dushanbe refuseniks to leave, uh, and for now Maimon to leave, and then subsequently we got into other cases. And uh, that was our main goal when we started. Can you pause for one second? Now, um, starting with Mary, I would like each of you to tell me your memories of the relationship between your two groups as they were forming. Now, I'd like you to express your memories of it at the time and how you were feeling about it at the time. Okay. Um, <clears throat> um, well, the Boulder Action for Soviet Jewry uh, first emerged for us, I think, in uh, right around the very beginning of 1987. And um, at that point, we had already, I, I went to Dushanbe and uh, made the first f official sort of contact in the fall of 86 in, in October. So we had just gotten something, a verbal agreement and the next thing that had to happen was the signing of papers. And that, so there was an arrangement. First they were going to come in March, and then we finally arranged that um, a delegation would come from Dushanbe in May, and the city council and so forth, and the city of Boulder would welcome them. Um, <clears throat> the preparations for this were uh, very difficult. We had uh, lots and lots of different uh, sorts of things we were trying to set up. And uh, with the language department, the public Casals trio played, made a private, you know, we, we had breakfast, chamber of commerce, celestial seasonings, you know, this sort of way of showing Boulder uh, and showing, you know, people who had never been to, to the United States to, you know, what it was like. So it involved lots and lots of people and was very co complex from my point of view, for sure. <laughs> um, so the, the advent of, of, a, of the Boulder Action for Soviet Jewry was not, was not welcome from my point of view because we didn't want to talk. Part of our, our goal was to meet people and not land in the same uh, contested sorts of issues. And particularly since this was people to people and the idea is a long-term relationship, it was to, to have them come to greet them, to like eat with them, and have those more small talky kinds of things, and um, and so for me it, it was, and for other members of the group, it was like because this is obviously a huge issue, the issue of refuseniks and Soviet Jewry um, is a huge issue and uh, contested, and lots and lots of uh, people with very specific interests that we didn't want the uh, the whole visit Shanghai by this issue and especially introducing something that would because it took so many years to get this thing going and to persuade them that we were okay <laughs> that we were not going to harm them <laughs> to make sure that when they came that they wouldn't feel embarrassed and that they had had uh, been deceived in any way because we were all I mean and, and it was very mild every things we were not raising hard issues and this was by design um, those issues were being raised everywhere, as far as we could tell, <laughs> so, <laughs> and were well aired. <laughs> so our idea was to invite them, have them come, establish some kind of rapport, and, uh, and then try to get a little something moving. And then, of course, as friendships are, to, to have honest interchanges you know, along the way, but not as the first, the first meeting. Now, Bill, your memories um, and your feelings at the time. Well, I think what Mary has related is certainly what was communicated to us, and fairly clearly where they were coming from and what they did and didn't want to do. Um, that was before even BASJ met when I met with her. And um, I think she delivered the same message. She knew about refuseniks, but now was not the time. And as Jews, we came from a different philosophical place. Uh, 
one of the most famous creeds known as Hillel's creeds that many Jews operate under, particularly activists like myself, goes something like this. If I'm not for myself, who will be? If I'm only for myself, who am I? And if not now, when? And the issue of refusing to us wasn't some kind of debate over nuclear weapons or, or some, uh, something larger that couldn't be solved by us anyhow, but it was dealing with individual human beings whose lives were and liberties were at stake and who were being specifically singled out for persecution over and above the normal totalitarian state that um, the Soviet Union represented. And now was when we wanted to raise this and deal with it. I think where we never connected and where Mary and I have had great conversations since recently is how we were planning to go about it. We weren't challenging the establishment of the sister-city relationship. In fact, we welcomed it. We saw it as an opportunity to raise the issues of these, at the time, 100 refuseniks um, with the government who had control over these things. And we didn't intend, although they didn't know this, to beat these people over the head with it. Uh, in fact, when we finally did meet, and we'll get to, to that, we trained specifically in citizen diplomacy, Murray and I, on how to sit down and have a conversation with a Soviet official about a difficult issue like Refusnik. And we'll get to that. So that's right at the beginning, we were not communicating to each other how we could do this together. And it became no, no, no. And we are not saying yes, yes, yes. And um, your classic sort of <laughs> <laughs> situation. Well, you have a meeting of the mind. Uh, in retrospect, I think it would have been good if we had a mediator oh. who might have been able to bring us together. But who, who knows historically? We had no we'll, time for we'll a mediator. We'll get to that. <laughs> now, at this point, would either of you like to respond to what the other has said? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, in an ideal world, I think that what you said <laughs> could have happened, but I don't think we would have been open. I think we were simply not open. And even if we had understood what you, you know, you know that you had trained and you were going to be really nice <laughs> and so forth, that the, because of the way the media operated, that, that these, con these contentious issues always took over, uh, regardless of what, you know, because a lot of the stuff we were doing were so soft. I mean, we had those spring things where we were training people to do, or teaching people to do, dye Ukrainian eggs, and, you know, it's all little, you know, make poppy seed cake and stuff like that, <laughs> and learn the most basic things about Russian history and the losses in the war, and there, you know, these kinds of things that people were ignorant of. That, that that issue, because, and it's partly because um, there have been, it has been, had been successfully raised so well. I mean, the issue was raised, I mean, as, you know, you, I listened to your, you know, that Tim Worth, that you had people, well-known people who would show up and, you know, so that the possibility of, of what we were trying to do being subsumed and, and really, for my, what I was most concerned about was that these people would not feel blindsided, that they didn't feel that we, with what we said, we wanted to have student exchanges and doctors and things like this, that, that this issue, which is obviously every Soviet official knew was an issue, to bring them and then to like, have that come up without their being prepared. I just didn't, you know, it was like, you know, we wanted to make friends, and we didn't, I don't know. I mean, it was just a point of view about how you went about this. That if I want to be friends with you, and we have a major issue that's, or major issues, mainly that, you know, other people in our name, governments, are saying, you know, you're terrible people, your system is terrible, all this is going on. That we wanted to start at some level without those issues. And without the nuclear issues either. I mean, it was not, the war issues were off the table. That was not, it was, in that viewpoint, I think, precluded 
and it was fear. You know, we were just. I was afraid that the media would just. Next thing you know, it was the central issue, and the rest of it was swallowed, and that we wouldn't get the thing off the ground. That was the real. You know, that we wouldn't be able to get it from A to B. So it was that. Uh, and, and I know that was their fear. I guess we disagreed, you know, myself not so much, but I was part of a national and international network who had been dealing with the Soviets on this, these issues for a long time. And the Soviets never hesitated to meet with us, to talk to us about it, and actually ultimately to get results. Yes, we brought to bear, in most cases, congressional letters and uh, administrative direct contact, but th there was, this was already in the Gorbachev era, you know, there was regular con contact between our State Department people and even the President and Gorbachev and his predecessors over these issues. These were not hidden issues and it wasn't new to Soviets. Secondly, we had a different perception about what the sister city actually was. I know what Mary's intent was it'd be people to people and deal with little things like, you know, chicken farms and wool. Little and things that turn out to be... Yeah, I'm, I'm not challenging <laughs> the intent of doing that. But that wasn't our perception of what mm -hmm. the Soviets wanted. And I, I really got this, not from the meetings here, but when, when actually both of us were in Seattle for a Sister City International big conference. Um, and there was all kinds of people from New Hampshire that were wanting to sell wool to the Soviet Union and eggs and, you know, little, little folk, you know, mom and pop. Folk. And what did the Soviet mayors who came over want to do? They wanted to meet with Boeing and Lockheed, major high-tech industry. That was their objective. People to people was a nice excuse. This is from my perception. Uh, to get over here. Uh, but they wanted to meet with the captains of industry. They wanted to get big contracts to improve their society and make a lot of money. And that was one thing. Second thing where it wasn't purely people to people, my understanding that the Soviets insisted that to establish the relationship of a sister city, the city councils had to meet, reach an agreement. They had to sign a contract. And True. That, to me, made it government to government. And if my government, the City of Council Boulder, is negotiating a contract, and the terms of it, as far as I'm concerned, are public, subject to public input, including we as part of the public. And so we went in and advocated that the contract actually be changed from the original uh, that was signed uh, to include human rights as an issue in the sister city uh, relationship. And the city council adopted it and the city of Dushanbe agreed to it. So we didn't see the harm that Mary was afraid of. Now, Mary, would you like to respond? Yeah, I, would, I think we should talk to each other. Yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> otherwise it's too much like presenting a case. Okay. I agree. I think we should definitely talk okay. to each other. Um, well, we disagree more now than we have in, really? the, in the past few conversations. <laughs> yes. Tell me. Uh, okay. Um, okay, there are two, there are two issues. One, the, I think we should talk about the Seattle conference separately. Um, when I say people to people, it's not that we wanted to keep it as Mickey Mouse things. Ideally, yes, trade, and the reason, you know, we're not at war with France because there's there are huge trade interests. I was, we were wide open to having that sort of stuff develop. But really, we're talking about Boulder and Dushanbe. So we were talking, you know, what we were trying to do was not some massive thing. We're trying to connect, make one connection to create a, a bridge of some kind that cre could create, where, where there could be a practice of mutual understanding. Um, the, con the city had to sign because we have two systems that operated in totally different ways. The city never spent any money on this. It was a private organization. It was a private nonprofit. Ultimately, they gave land for the tea house. Well, they got a gift. They got a $750,000 building <laughs> for, 
for that land. <laughs> well, they made a loan also. Yeah, but they, it's all, everybody's, they're making money. Well, they took a risk. Well, yeah. the tea house wasn't the initial, the, during the initial thing, that was a separate deal. Right. That, that there were no, it didn't bind the city in any major way. It, because the, from that side, everything was so highly bureaucratized, those guys had to have something signed. So in a way, it was a kind of odd formality, like so many of these things that happened because the systems were utterly different. And so we had to meet, and, and the thing has been cultural understanding the whole way and cultural confusion. Um, so that was just, that was a sine qua non from the Soviet national government standpoint that these guys had to have something on paper. Which, which makes sense. And of course, they have no grassroots groups, and they had no way to do it any other way. Well, that, I, I understand that that had to happen. Yeah. But at the same time, when that happens, from our perspective, since you're saying to us, we, we don't want you in this project at this time, we saw that as an opening for us to get in it. And one of the things we were proposing was a Jewish community exchange yeah. and synagogue to synagogue exchange, which we felt fit right into the people to people, uh -huh. cultural. I know religious was a red flag for you guys uh, because you perceived it to be a red flag for the Soviets. Uh, Not that. It's we perceived it as being some kind of hot potato that would create where, where dialogue would devolve into yelling. This is that it was really... I, I understand that had been your experience, but that, yeah. we didn't do that. No, I, I'm not, I don't think you did. But that's why we didn't want to have a joint effort. I mean, it was not, the, yeah, the joint the, part didn't feel, it's, it's the partly, you know, I, I, the single-mindedness of your group, and I, I don't mean that in any sort of, uh, that's not derogatory in any way. And uh, I think I even said in my interview that, that you were a zealot, Bill, and that I recognize you because I was a zealot too. <laughs> <laughs> when you have a zealous single point that you're after, uh, everything else is grays out in a way. And and I experienced, I and I, I mean fully, I really was a zealot. I, I mean, when I was uh, working on disarmament issues, I honestly could clear a room in about two minutes <laughs> <laughs> that people would want to get out of my range <laughs> because I only had one topic that I wanted to talk about. <laughs> so it was that, because we had all these, the schools, we had all these different groups, that that focus, that intense intelligence and focus was like, oh man, hmm. this is gonna skew this in some way that then we're gonna have to run around trying to quiet it or make it less, which, which would feel to you guys like some kind of suppression of Something. Well, we but. felt like, and remember this is a group of Jews, yeah. like we were being excluded right. and, and forced to, to be out of the center of it yeah. and to do our own thing, which we did. In retrospect, I'll tell you, I think we were happy to do it that way because then, uh -huh. because we felt hostility, whether that was intended or not, or at least certainly not lack of trust. And we didn't want to have to go through your group because we didn't trust you. Yeah. And we were able to successfully meet with and establish relationships with members right. of the Jewish community um, in Dushanbe on our own. And that worked fine for us. Uh, it didn't feel good because we felt we weren't trying to threaten your organization. And in fact, we were in favor of it. It wasn't that you were trying. And, and I, I know you perceive that just by being there, it would happen. Yeah, I, I and had that's, that's where us talking together today, I think, is helpful. Yeah. Um, would we have been able to talk 20 some odd years ago? That's debatable because of the place we were in. I think, at the I time. think the nature of the time, I mean, we had, you know, on our board, there were 10 people, three, we had three, there were three Jews on our board. And not, they weren't on our board because they were Jews. They were on our board because they were also interested in peace and Barbara Engel taught Russian history and, you know, we had. So, uh, yeah, I th you know, this is what I mean. I think there was no, and, and so I don't, there was no way 
from our perspective, and I, I should really speak from, you know, I'm, this is my memory, so I should speak for myself. There was no way to not have this pull, pull us down, if not off, into some other, where we felt we had to protect the people. And, and, you know, and, and I'm not claiming that we're, you know, we maybe misconstrued how this was going to, you know, but we thought you guys had a real, pol you know, a, a political goal that was shared by lots of Jewish groups around the country that had organization, that had a history, I mean, from, through the Brezhnev and drop off through those eras. You had a whole channel and that, that you could do that better there and we could do this thing over here and in time then there could be a merger. And never once did I think that there wouldn't be a, a possibility of Jews exchanging and of, you know, I didn't know there were refuseniks there, but of whatever um, could happen. You know, it wasn't an idea that this is, you know, not going to, that it's going to exclude down the line. And I know you have the, that's a compelling statement, if not now, when? But boy, we just thought like, like just a little later. <laughs> it wasn't like the kind of never, you know, like uh, that, you know, we'd like you in our club, but you know, we're not comfortable now or something like that. It wasn't any of that kind of stuff. But I can see how it would feel that way. Well, it felt that way. But and what what sort of frustrated us is we sent two representatives on the first post signing trip that went off in May of eighty seven. No, in June of eighty seven, one month after the Mayor right. Kramoff was here and we should talk about that meeting. Um, and that's when we established contact with members of the Jewish community and these refusals. Yeah. And uh, we learned a great deal about the community. Uh, we um, ultimately got our first family that we resettled in Boulder came out of that meeting. Uh -huh. uh, See, I think that's great. And subsequently, probably a couple dozen families from Duchamp Bay mm -hmm. came here um, and we resettled them. Um, and the other thing that came out of that not that long afterwards was the deputy mayor from Duchamp Bay came to Boulder and he came with the spe specific purpose of meeting with us. Mm -hmm. So the threat issue that you were afraid of should have been out of the way right then. Uh, that it was clear that they were willing to engage us. And let me finish and okay. say what he, he did. Sure. He came with uh, an invitation from a group called Chavarim, which means friends, which was the cultural body of Jews in Dushanbe, mm -hmm. not the religious body. Mm -hmm. And they said and they wanted to establish a relationship be mm -hmm. between the Jewish community in Boulder and yeah. Chabarim. Um, the head of that was a man named Dr. Yuno Datchayev, uh, who we knew of as a famous chest surgeon, well revered all over D Tajikistan. Mm -hmm. And his son ultimately, uh, Robin Datchayev, became my personal contact. I had actually several and as they left, I, they'd hand the job down. Mm -hmm. And he hosted us when I was in Dushanbe. His whole family, including Dr. Yuno Darkai, emigrated to Boulder. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it was the official deputy at mayor who facilitated that contact. So, and, and the meeting was with, you were, this was past your being there, so I, that's why I'm explaining yeah. to you. Uh, was with members of your committee and us and the deputy mayor. So it should have been clear at that point that the officials in Dushanbe didn't, uh, did not see this as a negative thing that was going to disrupt or dismantle their sister city relationship. In fact, it was an expansion. Yeah. And yet we were never allowed sort of inside the show. Yeah, I don't know about I know, yeah, I know this is past your time there. Yeah, I mean, it's because it strikes me that this is a precisely the way, to me, this is an ideal. If somebody had said, you know, given me a picture of, uh, you know, two years ahead or whatever, that this is what this would look like, I think this is perfect. Well, this perfect was, two, this was you, one month after the, the agreement was signed. 
Well, you so so. Roxanne no, a few months after. Yeah, so all right. So you're talking about the trip with Roxanne and Rebecca. Well, Bradley yeah, but it, it was after that trip. Yeah. So all right. So that. A few uh, months. Okay. Well. Yeah. Short time. Short time. Yeah. But to have synagogue to synagogue or community to community, which, you know, served exactly the purpose that we were hoping for. I mean, without, without. Uh, turning it into the same. The same conversations that end up with pe ended up with people locking horns, and I guess you know my my experience. I was on this Young Leaders Exchange in 1983, I guess, and uh, and I had that experience, which was very difficult. I, and I was named the spokesperson for the group mainly because they just threw me to the dogs, the other young leaders, <laughs> let me be the the media person. But we became, because we were thrown together, there were, I can't remember how many, maybe there were 10 of us and 10 of them, something like that. Nobody was that young, by the way. <laughs> 10 Soviets and? Mm -hmm, 10 Soviets and mm -hmm. roughly, I, I can't quite remember, but something like that. And as in any group, when you do this, you become protective. Uh, that, that we were being, I didn't organize this thing, I was just a member of it. And we would go places, and every, people would be, be ready to take shots at these people. And it's not that we agreed with, you know, that we were, we were stuck in this position. It's not that we were pro-Soviet and thought it was a great, you know, socialist heaven over there and that, that all these issues were false. We didn't think that at all. But you become protective of the individuals, which was exactly the thing. Like, we just didn't want them. Like, we went to the Coors Brewery and Pete Coors got up on the stage and put <laughs> up a chalkboard and wrote, supply, demand. <laughs> <laughs> on the chalkboard, like he was going to tell them what they had missed. <laughs> and then they would see the light, that that's really how the world worked. <laughs> uh, which, that wasn't a bad one. The bad one was when Bill Owen took them, they, they're all eating, we're eating these little things out of a basket, and he read the Soviet Constitution and then just went on to humiliate them totally. So I had experienced this exactly how it worked in around the same predictable issues. And it's not that the issues are, I don't mean to demean the issues, it's just like they have been covered and covered and covered. And, and as soon as, you know, it's like the kind of uh, my eyes glaze over syndrome, like, oh my God, are we here again doing this? And, our, and, I, and I know this sounds, probably sounds painful to you because it sounds like a diminishment. It's not, it's like wanting something else, some context to enlarge. So those issues could actually be held and not be just a bunch of bullets that you come out shooting every time, you know, you say, we'd really like to meet you and come over and everybody's got their guns drawn when people arrive. So this is really, and I, maybe I'm being redundant, but uh, that was the sense of, of trying to take things out of the same this and that, and, and also forcing them to lie. I mean, I had a, on the trip I took to the Soviet Union, I, I made an agreement with myself that from the first day that the in-tourist guide I was with for three weeks, we went all through the stands and so forth, that, that you know, she's saying party line stuff. She's a party member. It's an in-tourist thing. You know, this is what it is. It was the only way to go through the Soviet Union, virtually. Well, through in-tourist, you had, it was pretty tough not to have an in-tourist guide. And, um, that I wouldn't ask her questions that, that forced her to lie. Mm -hmm. And she knew on the tour, I, I mean, I don't mean to brag, but there were, it was a UN tour, and I had studied a whole bunch of the, about the Soviet Union. I knew more than anybody in the bus. There were like 40 people on this tour. And, and I just had the information. I had statistics, I had facts about stuff. And, and I realized that I could be the person on the bus who every time she said something, contradicted her and said, well, what about this? What about that? What about this? Explain this. And I just thought, you know, I'm just not going to do this because there's no point to it. Everybody has already heard this, these kinds of interchanges. And, uh, and what happened then was we developed a friendship. I mean, this woman has come to Boulder several times and, and I learned more about how things really were in the Soviet Union by becoming her friend and, uh, and you know, where there was truth in our relationship. And that's what was my image, I guess, mm -hmm. was that kind of slow 
easy, you know, like not just just move slowly and then start to say, you know, what's it like to have to say this stuff all the time? And I guess we had a different, yeah. If I could take, I'd like to give you a chance to respond to that. Um, but once you responded, I was hoping you could get and talk specifically about the mayor's visit. Yeah. That's okay, okay sure. So you you think we can go on forever, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. <laughs> I think we had a different sense of what the timeline was uh -huh. and a different way to go about it, which is illustrated by the meeting with the mayor, um, which, as I have mentioned, Murray and I trained for. Yeah. And the idea was to not come in with a hammer and mm -hmm. beat them over the head, to come in and establish respect for the other party, uh, to do it symbolically. Uh, through understanding a little bit about their culture, through the exchange of gifts, uh, although the gifts we brought were Jewish paraphernalia, uh, which you seem to think was wrong. Uh, but let me finish. And, uh, and to raise the issue, the, the tough issue, as you see it, the question of refusal, uh, in a somewhat gentle but clear way. You were there, although we have different perceptions of what memories. went on, <laughs> memories. Um, by saying to him, uh, there is an issue that we'd like to bring up after we talked about having exchanges between Jewish communities and here's the gifts we'd like to, to deliver, which he said he would. Um, and that is this issue of refusal. And he seemed to calculate politically in his brain how to respond. And in mid-sentence, he, he sort of started out by saying, well, this is outside my realm. And he said, but I can help. And uh, if there are any such cases, he's not aware of any such cases, but if there are any such cases, bring them to my attention. We'll do something. Well, we thought that was a tremendous breakthrough. Mm -hmm. In fact, we had a press conference afterwards, and we told the press that that was his commitment, which gave him a positive headline. Uh, From from our perspective, yeah, from <laughs> yeah. I mean, here's a guy saying he can help with the human rights issue. Yeah. And in fact, subsequently he did. Yeah. A very tough case yeah. that was very intransigent. I won't go into the details. Did he take the gifts? Did the, did the he took the gifts. And he gave them? And did they show up there? No. When Roxanne and Rebecca went there, they asked the people at the uh -huh. synagogue, did you get the gifts? And they said no. Mm -hmm. So they met with the mayor and they said, what well, happened to our gifts? The gifts were then delivered. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, that's advocacy. It wasn't beating people over the head, yeah, it was just yeah, being no, firm. You, this is, seems fine. Yeah. Uh, and then subsequent to the mayor's meeting, we got the meeting from the deputy mayor saying they brought this issue up with the Jewish community, and the Jewish community, at least one aspect of yeah. it, wanted to establish it. And here they were, the officials, delivering that message to us. Yeah. And we said, great. We still want to meet with the uh, established relation with the religious communities, but here is a letter to them saying we'll establish it, and here's some more gifts which mm -hmm. were delivered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well. So that's... that we did. We we did it through their governmental channels, which we understood. You know, everybody had to go through, mm -hmm. uh, and we went from there. Uh, and um, two years later, in 1989, when I was in the Soviet Union and went to Dushanbe to meet with the mayor. He was actually out that day planning a coup. Um, but his deputy I went mayor... once and the guy was on a boondoggle. Yeah. <laughs> the deputy mayor met with us. <laughs> he knew all about the case. He said he'd, they'd do what they could. And we followed up and the guy got permission. And that was the second case that yeah. they helped us with. You know, so, I think one thing that's missing here, mm -hmm. Bill, which is when I, you know, the, it was in 1983 that, first of all, uh, that Reagan gave that speech um, about the U uh, about the Soviet Union being the, the evil focus, empire? the focus of evil in the world mm -hmm. was his. Uh, that really got under my skin. I have to say, <laughs> the f word "focus of evil" struck me as a target of some kind, <laughs> but. Uh, that, so that's 83. When, when I arrived in Dushanbe, I just reviewed my, a lot of my materials, uh, and when I arrived, the first, the guide in Dushanbe, who was a young guy, um, 
when I arrived and spoke to him when we started to talk, I asked him about Gorch Gorbachev, he said, and he said, everything is changing. He said, you know, you can feel it. And I think that Gorbachev, that stuff really just started in 86, 87, I don't remember when. Gorbachev well, we took over in 85. Yeah, so I think. It took him a little while. It took too. him a little while, but so I think the kinds of, of I think in 83, if, well, of course, we wouldn't have had a sister city in 83, but if, you know, he had done this, I don't think any Soviet official would have carried religious paranoia, Jewish well, religious that's stuff. That's probably to, true. I, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So in a way, we benefited, you know, from the times in ways that we probably don't even understand. And that he could do that, that he could take those things and not be, uh, you know, there was enough play where he could actually take them to his office, at least. I, I'm amazed he took them. I, I thought they were going to be he in did. the airport. They were there. Yeah. Well, that's, I think, yeah. And the other thing that's, I think, of, of particular interest is that the way the Soviet Union worked was that the most intense surveillance and control and so forth was at the center, which Moscow was called the center. And the farther you got from the center, the more there was a sort of, uh, you know, ability to move around the edges a little bit. And, and the third thing, and last thing, is that, that Tajikistan, uh, in particular, was very happy to be in the Soviet Union because they could look across the border and see Afghanistan. And for women, in particular, um, it was an enormous because everybody's in the Chador just across the border. Mm -hmm. So there was a certain uh, a kind of sense of freedom that they felt vis-a-vis -vis the tr people who were speaking the same language, Pashtuns. They're, I think they're, they're Pashtuns in uh, Dushanbe, too. I'm pretty sure that's Pashtun tribe. But, but that, uh, you know, because it's an artificial line. Yeah, I know they speak Farsi. Yeah, they speak Farsi. Uh, yeah. yeah, so do the, a lot of the Jews. Yeah, well, that was the... T Tajik is a Farsi, you know, related mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, so anyway, all these things sort of played that they were far enough away from Moscow that they could get away with stuff that maybe you couldn't get away with closer, and that you had Gorbachev there. Well, and then that, that was interesting and that you guys were really great, <laughs> too. <laughs> no, I mean, that you used a soft, you, you obviously were terrific in, in, you know, getting trained was really fantastic. I wish I had known that then. I would have really made me feel better. Yeah, I think uh, had Witty been able to sit down and have a conversation like we've had in the last few months, uh -huh. we would have learned a lot about each other, like I learned from watching your interview. Yeah. Uh, we have common activist experiences mm -hmm. in I Vietnam know. and particularly Rocky Flats. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I think we could have talked to each other and maybe uh, uh, you would have come to trust because at least we could have explained to you that we're going to do this softly, but we're going to do it. Yeah. See, from my point of view, the hand giving them the religious objects was not. It you know, it felt like it was designed to embarrass. The the, the as it turned out, it wasn't that. But that's what to to put him in a put the put the screws to him to say, okay, you say this. And, and you even said, actions, not words. So now he's got these things which were toxic like a few years before. I don't know in Dushanbe. Well, they were, to this was not stuff. Yeah, no, I understand. In Dushanbe, yeah. uh, you're, you're perfectly right. As, uh, about as far as you can get yeah. away from the center. The Jews were much more able to practice Judaism. Mm -hmm. right. The synagogues were active. I was there for... Yom Kippur in uh, 91, and the place was packed, mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and Mary they, they a had a, a matzah factory there. Yeah, well, yeah, fantastic. Well, yeah. Ikramov was a practicing Muslim. Yeah, and there was good relations Which, between the Muslims and the Jews most of the time, uh -huh. not all the time. Now, that was breaking down as the Soviet Union was breaking up, and that's when we got active, and I, I want to tell you something that you would never know, nobody outside the Soviet Jewry movement would know, and that was hardly anyone in the Soviet Jewry movement was paying attention to Central Asia, mm -hmm. the Jews there. There was one other group, 
uh, run by a colleague of mine, Helene Kenvin, the Caucasus Network, who focused on Central Asia and the Caucasus, and us. And our only reason for getting involved is because it was our sister city. Yeah. So these 95 to 100 refusics were not known to the movement until we mm -hmm. went in and did some research and found out. And no one was advocating for them yeah. until they we got started. They must think you were angels. Well, I mean, really. That's another story. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, flying in from out of nowhere to this completely remote place. Yeah, I mean, I spent <laughs> three days there, two of which I spent holding clinics all day long, mm -hmm. uh, meeting with people who wanted to get out and go in various places, either to the U.S. or to Israel, or or had other issues that they thought we could help, and sometimes mm -hmm. we could, and sometimes we couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when I met with the deputy mayor, it was very interesting. This was right after the failed coup, which happened in August of 91. We were in Moscow, and we saw the places where the people were shot by the tanks, and where they had memorials and everything. Um, and <laughs> Over the head of the deputy mayor's office was a oriental rug with the image of Lenin woven into it. It was still up, mm -hmm. even though it was clear the Soviet Union was breaking up. Yeah, but they held on longer. They did. Yeah. yeah they held on longer, and they maintain a they maintain a repressive regime to the point that at one point the U.S. government kicked out the president of Tajikistan as persona non grata. Now, of course. We love them because it's a jumping off point for Afghanistan. <laughs> so politics are strange. Uh, but so we, that was why we saw the sister city as an opportunity. Yeah, and it was. And it turned out to be. Yeah. Uh, and as you, you and I have said to each other, it changed both our, yeah. our lives, I think, for the better. It, mm. it did call upon each of us to use all the skills we'd learned in the many different things we'd done in life professionally up until mm -hmm. that point. Yeah. Uh, it was the most challenging and exhausting thing I ever did. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think in retrospect, we both achieved our major goals, Yeah. even though we ne never worked together. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly, the histories of both these groups are very closely interrelated. Totally. <laughs> Can you reflect on a little bit just, just how closely that was? I mean, you've very well illustrated that. But just now, looking back 20 years later, at how closely these two histories are related, and how closely maybe the success of these two groups made the time. Mm -hmm. Well, hindsight is twenty twenty. I mean, uh, I can recall some of my emotional feelings about the frustration I had with the Sister City group. Uh, we had other meetings. Mary was not involved in it. Uh, one, of, one of my first contacts, persons, I would have like try to establish a liaison person in Dushanbe uh, who spoke English, who could, I could communicate about because I was helping these people get out and come to the United States as refugees or you know, whatever the problems were, go to Israel. Or, Whatever it was. So they were cases, and I was running a public interest law firm. The f first liaison was the sister of the first family that came here. Um, and they, she and her husband came to Moscow and met me there in 89, my first trip over there. And they told me what was going on in Dushanbe in terms of the Jewish community, the rising anti Semitism, the violence, the civil battles between Muslim groups and Russians and Jews and Armenians and all this stuff was going on. It had been in the news. She, they then went back to Dushanbe and within a few weeks, I think, their children, they had three young children, were out on their little front yard and a drunken military man came and started beating them and cursing them for being Jewish. And I got a hysterical call from her what can we do? I said, well, the only thing I can do is try and see if I can expedite your refugee case. And I did. Called to contact at the State Department, worked it out. We got their case expedited. It still took a year to get them out of there. Um, 
a delegation of doctors from Dushanbe came to Boulder mm -hmm. and met and were hosted by a delegation of doctors here mm -hmm. right after this case had come. And I wanted to bring this case up to them. Because I knew they also had officials with them. So they never traveled without officials. And I pushed and arranged for the meeting. And we had the meeting. And first of all, the doctor, you know, we did the same low-key approach. And I would like to bring up this case, you know, after we went through the dog and pony show of being nice to them. Hmm. You're a group of doctors. You should be sensitive to a child or children being beaten in your community. Well, I got the opposite reaction. I got, I got real hostility from the, from the Soviet doctors. Well, maybe these kids, the youngest was, I think, four, provoked this soldier and all this. And I was pretty shocked at that response. Subsequent to that, I got reports from colleagues in the community that the doctors were bad-mouthing us in the operating room. I had friends come up to me and say, you're, going, you're being too hard on these people. The Soviet doctors? Are you talking about the Boulder doctors? Boulder doctors. Mm -hmm. And I subsequently learned, and I don't know if you know the reality of this or not, that why the doctor, local doctors were so upset is because they were hoping to sell a CAT scan to the doctors in Dushanbe. I've never heard this. Yeah. And I've never bothered to look it up because, you know, we didn't care about it. But it made me really deeply angry that those kinds of personal interests were overriding human rights violations where children are involved. Now, those children subsequently come here. The young girl involved is in medical school. I mean, they're doing great. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know anything about that. So those are, those are things that, you know, cause me to have real strong emotional feelings about it, to the point where, I think I told you, Brandon, it took me years before I would walk into the tea house, as beautiful as it is, um, to get over some of this. Mm -hmm feeling that um, I, I don't want to use bad language, but, but that there was something deeply wrong with the way Jews were being treated um, in the society that we had established this relationship with. Um, and and I, I think that affected me somewhat. You know, both as a yeah. person and as how I dealt with the organization uh, from time to time. We, we never, we actually came up with a policy that we would not oppose the Tea House, that that was not our issue. Our issue was constantly to raise human rights problems. And the Tea House was not it. At times I thought the Tea House was like a, um, I called it a Trojan Tea House. A, a way to divert attention from issues that we thought were important. Mm. But, you know, this is our perception. Yeah. And had we had a different relationship, we might not have thought that. And all we can do is learn from it. And, uh, See, I think there are ancillary effects, too, that you just can't take into account. You know, like in 91, when the Soviet Union collapsed, they, all sorts of minorities were suddenly in danger. Oh yeah. You know, all over the country. Because that that system, this repressive system, actually kept these tribal hatreds down. You know, when they were dressing up like in their little outfits and you know, having them be do their own culture and it was all highlighted as the peaceful you know, how the culture worked better than ours. You know, that as soon as when the system lifted, there was fighting everywhere. I, and so I think I the Jews were, I'm sure it got worse, but I think it got it worse did. for a bunch of people at the same time when just everybody's jockeying for power and trying to blame somebody for how bad things are and so forth. But, uh, no, that's absolutely true. And I actually studied that pretty carefully and gave a speech at Vassa College where my daughter was going to school uh -huh. about the, all, all these different, there were more than brush fires. These, 
these ethnic fights mm -hmm. that were going on all over the Soviet Union at the time. Yeah, well, there were tons of ethnic groups. So, yeah. um, so it was complex to work yeah. in that, and of course, it's funny we're talking about the Sister City Project as if it was the dominant thing that we, BSJ, and then the Center for Human Rights were dealing with. It wasn't. No, of course not. Well, it no, was an important part of it, mm -hmm. um, but uh, we were working all over the Soviet Union mm -hmm. with refugee cases and refusenik cases, and then I got deeply involved in criminal justice issues and uh, put on seminars in Moscow and St. Petersburg and Kiev, which was Ukraine. Uh, so our work was much broader than that. But this, this one, you know, this was our home, and we felt it was important that we be involved. That's a good pausing point. Mm -hmm. This is part B of the interview with Mary Kay and Bill Cohen. Today is March 4th, 2011, and my name is Brandon Springer. So, Bill, we left off. Well, what I was going to say is a, a couple of thoughts. One is, um, here we are 23 years later. Um, not, not so much as reminiscing, but trying to sort of reconstruct in our minds mm -hmm. what went on and what we didn't know about each other. Uh, and speculating on how we might have been done things differently, and if so, would it have made a difference? And I was say, thinking, does this have real educational value as a lesson in advocacy or about what happens in advocacy um, for someone studying as a student or even as a uh, adult who wants to take on some project. Um, and um, I don't know. Uh, sort of would ask Brandon and Chandler what, what they think about it. Um, I can say that while I know I called on a lot of resources that I had built up over the years, there was nothing that I had done that was quite like this. Mm -hmm. That, and there was no manual as such to go about it, especially dealing as we were with the Sister City. Nobody else in the Union of Councils dealt directly with the Sister City project. It, and with the Soviet Union. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there were. There weren't any. Well, no, there were there were several that were established. Uh, Seattle, for example. Well, the fi the original five. Yeah. yeah. But and there were lots of other ones. I was getting calls from all kinds of people. But that must have been later. It was subsequent. Yeah. Yeah, and some of them, interestingly enough, the Sister City group invited the Soviet Jury group in, mm -hmm. um, but that's here and they're there. Uh, what I'm saying is we. I and my colleagues had to invent the tactics. Yeah. Um, and we had no idea if they were, we were doing it right. You know, this, I could say the same thing. You well, know. I'm sure you can. And that's, <laughs> that's why I'm bringing it up. I think there's a commonality here. Yeah. Uh, we, I'm sure, made mistakes. Uh, hopefully they were small ones and didn't do harm. Um, and um, I almost think that there, you could teach a course in advocacy uh, and call on many different people, mm -hmm. you know, to come in as sort of experts and, and uh, train people on how to do it. Now, of course, I trained many, many young people who worked for me, recent college graduates who were fluent in Russian, um, college interns, law schools, law clerks, lawyers, recent graduates. Um, placed them in several places in the Soviet Union, communicated by email back then, oh. one of the first things, first times. It was incredibly challenging and risky. Um, I had one of my uh, law graduate interns in St. Petersburg, walked out of her door 
her apartment one morning and there was two guys standing there with guns. Walked her back into the apartment, tied her up and robbed her. Fortunately, didn't assault her. Uh, when I was in Dushanbe, talking to the deputy mayor, in walks this guy unannounced, hands me a card, says he's from the tourist bureau, invites me to take a helicopter ride into the Pamiers. I was sure he was KGB. And uh, I wasn't concerned about my safety, but I was concerned about Robin Dachaib, who was sitting right there, who had to stay there for a few months. Uh, so you don't know what to expect. You don't know where it's leading. You try the best you can. But um, there's some lessons to be learned about. Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully some of this conversation can be of value to those in the future, if they ever get to see it, uh, about how to go about it. But I guess, again, they're going to be confronted with unique situations as well. I think about, uh, you know, Kierkegaard says that uh, one of the paradoxes of life is that we have to, we live our lives forward, but we really only understand them in retrospect. That's, and, that's interesting. Yeah, so there, there we're always in this situation in a way. You, but, you know, essentially you saw a harm being done and responded. And, and I think, um, you know, when I saw a threat or we saw a threat to the world and responded in the way that we could. And, you know, not, you know, it would be preposterous to say, you know, that we, you know, we're going to save the world. But, you know, it's like, it's the energy that got, I mean, I, I put every single bit of my energy into this for, for years. I mean, and, and the underlying sense, I mean, I guess it's like being an artist. You know, you paint because you don't really, in a sense, think you're going to be a famous artist, but some part of you does <laughs> <laughs> under there. Or you, you know, that's where the, the drive and the excellence comes from, you know, that, that makes you ser serious about, about it even though you can't possibly know where you're going to end up. And, and I think one thing is that the relations, I mean, I, in a way, you know, you know, it feels like a rapprochement to hear, you know, that we're having 24 years later. Because, you know, you say you were ticked off at the Soviet Union and wouldn't, or at the Soviet Sister City Project, or Boulder Duchambe Sister Cities, for all those years. Well, you know, I, I have been pretty, I've been ticked off at you, not actively. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> no, but you know, I hope it's. I haven't had to have therapy no, on <laughs> No, <laughs> but you know, as, a, as some kind of something, you know, and so I think the coming around, this is important, it's, this is important for, you know, it's like healing the world in a way, because these kinds of things are going on in our lives all the time, where there are harms of sort of hurts of some kinds, and the, they either, come around or they don't and uh, so I mean one of the thrills of doing this and having these conversations with you Bill has been this wonderful sense that that there was we I think we all acted decently I, I really do I don't think you know we didn't try to thwart you in any way and you didn't try to you know undermine the sister city relationship so there was decency there was a solid even even though we couldn't you know get on the same bus, you know, that there was decency. And that allows this moment to take place. I, I agree with you, because I don't, I don't ever feel that you did anything personal to harm me or my interest or, yeah, well, I, I, uh, or the groups. Um, and um, I've always felt that we, we had a friendly relationship, even though we weren't necessarily friends. Yeah, just kind of. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but I think now we are. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and so this has been very valuable to me. Uh, I could even buy you a cup of tea at the tea house. Oh wow, that would be. Maybe we should do that. Yeah, we should <laughs> to cement the relationship. But um, I don't know what else to say. Uh, it's it's eye opening to hear the other side. Uh, even 24 years later. Yeah. Well, and for me to understand, I mean, and part of my being irritated back then meant that I didn't really track what you did. So it has been completely humbling to find out. When you, when you said on the phone that you had been to the Soviet Union nine times, I was so blown away. 
such a hard place to go. <laughs> so, but that and that uh, and that you really successfully over eleven years or however long it was, really more than that. Yeah, got so many people out. I mean, I I didn't know that, which is it's to my shame that I didn't know that. That it just felt it made me f really feel bad <laughs> in a way that I had not attended in a way that was really required of me, I think. Well, wow. it just in some way. I'm, I'm just talking about myself, not for you, but for me. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that, I, that I just had nothing more to do with it. So that part feels, this just feels correct in a way. Well, which I'm glad. I mean, um, this was by far my proudest body of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me too. And, uh, which is why I'm really pleased with uh, this project and the work that Chandler and, mm -hmm. and uh, Brandon and Becky and the other students have, the way they've embraced it. Uh, and uh, it's been sort of exciting to have the resources we have to, to do this, mm -hmm. you know, to have a Jewish studies program at the university, to have one of the foremost oral history project directors at our public library here, mm -hmm. Susan Becker, and, and, uh, and the people are still here mm -hmm. and accessible to us, really. and, and they're so enthused about recording their history, and mm -hmm. we're learning, I personally am learning so much that I never saw or knew what was going on while I was in the middle of the fray, mm -hmm. so right. to speak. Um, that it's been tremendously rewarding, and then I think this adds our conversation yeah. a kind of unique dimension to the project. Yeah, well, we all we all have a little piece of the truth here. Yeah, somewhere. Yeah, somewhere. Yeah. Well, maybe all together. <laughs> the uh, could be greater than the sum of its parts. I don't know. <laughs> now, I, I do have one last question. Yeah. Um, if you could do it all over again, what? You mean might these be? interviews? No, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> If you had gone back 25 years, uh -huh. the 1980s, two groups were organizing, would either of you have done anything differently, given these conversations we've had, given what you know now? I think I would have tried to engage Mary off the scene, sort of taken her for coffee, and talked about each of our personal backgrounds to try to establish trust first before entering into a political discussion about what they were doing and what we were doing as groups. Um, if that were possible, if there were a time, you know, it's hard to reconstruct the imperatives we felt we were under, each of us. Um, that might have made a difference. Might not have, but um, at some point it might have. Um, I think I feel good about the fact that we first made the entreaty to them, asked to be involved. We had a subsequent meeting, um, Roxanne and Murray and I, I think, with your whole board, and asked again. And um, See, I don't remember meeting with you the first time. I just remember you coming to the board. Oh, no, we had... We had lunch together. Oh. That was bef before we formed the whole thing. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and um, I think we behaved the way we wanted to behave. So I don't think I'd change any of that from that point on. But I think the beginning is what was critical here. And uh, I would have understood all of the things that they were putting, putting up with that were barriers at least they saw them as barriers, to even getting to where they got, establishing a relationship, and perhaps could have assured them that I'm as just as much a part of Boulder and understand Boulder as they do, and that we were going to do this Boulder style, not Colorado Committee of Concern for Soviet Jury style. You know, we weren't going to beat people over the head because we wanted, we thought there was a different way to get results. And. Um, I could give you an example. 
I'm aware of how we do it. There, there was a Georgian dance group, I believe it was, that came to perform at Mackey Auditorium. I have articles about it. Now, the typical Soviet jury approach or would have been to stand outside and protest and tell the people, don't go inside, don't go to this performance, because these, these people are criminals, they're murderers, they're evil, whatever, you know, it's a standard stuff. It's not how we did it. We, had, we stood outside and we handed out information sheets. Enjoy the show, but realize that there are performers, artists in the Soviet Union who can't come because they won't let them out. And we had names and artists. And we handed it out. And people were very, very respectful. The art critic of uh, the music critic wrote us up very positively. So we got good PR out of it. And we met backstage with all the artists and talked to them about these issues. So we achieved what we wanted. Nobody was mad at us. In fact, it probably, probably gained support. And um, we learned something about tactics. I'm afraid I wouldn't have done anything differently. <laughs> I can't think my way back. And, and it's in part because I know how completely harassed I was trying to put this thing together. And I resigned as the president the moment that the mayor got on the plane. <laughs> I mean, I had done it for those years, and I was really tired. So I don't think I would have had the room. I don't think I would have been able to, even if, if we had talked, I just don't think I would have had room to, to, to give up my, my worries. Yeah, and, and, I, and I, can I can understand that. Yeah, it's lots of trouble happens because of time, timing things. Mm -hmm. You know, that when time gets compressed too much, you get too busy or whatever, things shorten up in a way that... Well, you're also answerable to other people. Yeah. And that, that is a pressure. Um, I think I had the luxury of, uh, certainly in the beginning of this, because nobody was involved but me, and then there was two other people, of had I had this hindsight of shaping, perhaps, if, if there had been re recip res reciprocity, not reciprocity, re receptivity oh, mm -hmm. on the other side, and we don't know. But I guess I'm putting this on tape to suggest that mm -hmm. um, future conflicts should at least be approached a little differently, um, if there's room. Um, I think we did a pretty good job. Well, and we kind of lucked we out did. too. We you did. Know, I mean, <laughs> I, mean we <laughs> I think we agree that the end outcome for both of us is yeah. very positive, mm -hmm. and that's because we did still treat it respectfully. Yeah. The only place where where I ever have protested and I have protested for Soviet Jewry is in front of the Soviet Embassy, which, interestingly enough, during Gorbachev era, the last time they invited us to come inside. Uh huh. Nice. So things were changing. Yeah, they were changing. And in Seattle, where I don't know if you know this because. You were at the Seattle conference. The Seattle Committee for Soviet Jury up there tried for weeks, had meeting on top of meeting with the mayor's wife, who was in charge of this, to have them put on the program a discussion about human rights. They absolutely refused. And that's why we were forced to stand up in the middle of the meeting and tick off everybody who was there. <laughs> uh, I was there. Yeah, well, <laughs> I know. It, was, it, it didn't feel. It was scary to stand up in the middle yeah. of a meeting like that and, and then to get lambasted by people. I, I think you guys just didn't understand how delicate and how intricate this thing was and how much, you know, we were making, we were bushwhacking and making it up as we went along and, uh, and that it felt like we were just holding it together. And, um, you know, and we were on the cusp of actually getting really where we wanted to go. And so it just felt like, uh, you know, it, it's again, you know, it, it's a timing thing. And I don't think it's a timing thing of, you know, you say it's timing so you can blow the people off forever. It really wasn't that. It actually was a very particular time where there, there, was, there were these six cities 
and there were only two active relationships because the other ones didn't even work from 1973 to 1987 mm -hmm. and then so it took all that time now and then suddenly there were all little groups like us who were simultaneously having the same idea in Gainesville Florida Duluth Minnesota Madison you know and and then so because we were the only the there were six and then Madison was the seventh and we were the eighth they beat us out for by about a week <laughs> so I, yes. I have this recollection that someone in the southwest I don't know if it was Utah or Arizona also was starting one in the Jewish communities wanted to participate in, in, in at least one of those groups and was able to do so. I don't know. I don't remember anybody yeah. in the Southwest. But I, I, I don't have the specific notes to yeah. confirm that at my fingertips. Yeah, so, so anyway, there you have it. That's <laughs> I don't have anything else. Is there anything else that either of you like to discuss? No, thank you for I indulging us. Thank yes. you, Mary. Thank you, Bill. Glad to do it. Yeah.